My name is Kenny Hannes, and I've been able to completely reverse a severe case of ulcerative colitis by nutritionally optimizing my gut microbiome. I'm in clinical, endoscopic, and histologic remission. No medication, no symptoms, and no dietary restrictions. I am not a doctor or a dietitian, but I am now a nutritionist. I recently graduated from Texas A&M University with a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition. I've studied this, I have a good understanding of biochemistry, I understand the puzzle as a whole and how to put the pieces together. However, the information in this video still should not be taken as medical advice. You should always consult and listen to your doctor before making any dietary changes with the intent to treat an illness so that you can hopefully avoid any dangerous consequences. That being said, over the past few years, I've created this bootcamp series to lay out a roadmap of all the things that I think were the most effective in helping me heal. Before I go any further, I need to define what I believe healing is, because healed is a strong claim that isn't really accepted from a medical or scientific perspective. My definition of healing is to be able to consume a full range of foods without bleeding, mucus, urgency, or diarrhea, to have well-formed, solid bowel movements, and to be on no medication. This is the level of health I've been living at since the end of 2016. The Oxford Dictionary definition of remission is a diminution of the seriousness or intensity of disease or pain, a temporary recovery. The Oxford Dictionary definition of healed is to become sound or healthy again. I think my definition of healed is synonymous with becoming sound or healthy again rather than remission, which is just a temporary recovery. That is why I use the word healed, because my digestive system has become sound and healthy again. Just to be clear, this is not the protocol that I followed while healing. This is simply the protocol that I've designed based on the information that I learned during my healing process. However, I've learned so much more information since the first episode. I've read new research, met new people with similar stories, and I've also learned from coaching my clients which aspects of my approach people seem to have the most success with. So, because of all this new information, I've made some major changes to my bootcamp philosophy, specifically in regards to the consumption of fiber and meat. The core gut microbiome optimization principles are still the same, but the application is different than what some of the previous episodes have shown. So with that in mind, here's the outline of all the information and the recipes that are packed into this final episode. Feel free to skip to the recipes if you wish, but know that this is an information heavy episode and you might miss important material. Finally, welcome to the Long Loss Ulcerative Colitis Bootcamp Episode 10. My central theory about the cause of IBD, and therefore its reversal, revolves around the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is the total collection of microorganisms that inhabit the gastrointestinal tract which include bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and fungi. The gut microbiome is known to play a large role in the proper functioning of the immune system, and increasingly in the pathogenesis of IBD. Research has shown that the characteristic chronic inflammation of IBD is due to intestinal hyperpermeability of the intestinal epithelial cells in the mucosa of the small intestine and colon. Intestinal hyperpermeability, commonly called leaky gut, allows pathogenic entities such as undigested food particles, allergens, toxins, and viruses to cross the gut barrier unchecked and enter the systemic circulation. This causes the immune system to respond hyperactively in order to neutralize the pathogenic entities, resulting in chronically inflamed intestines. When healthy, intestinal epithelial cells of the mucosa are bolted together by dynamic protein structures called tight junctions. These tight junctions allow the paracellular pathways of intestinal epithelial cells to be selectively semi-permeable, allowing nutrients to diffuse into the bloodstream while excluding the aforementioned pathogenic entities. Faulty functioning tight junctions result in intestinal hyperpermeability, which results in a hyperactive immune response and then can ultimately lead to IBD if the inflammation becomes chronic. These vital gatekeeping proteins that influence intestinal permeability are regulated by microorganisms in the gut microbiome. Dysbiosis, or imbalance, within the gut microbiome can interrupt tight junction regulation, resulting in the cascade that leads to IBD. Gut microbiome dysbiosis is the root cause of intestinal hyperpermeability which results in a hyperactive immune response to invading pathogens and can ultimately result in chronic inflammation and the pathogenesis of IBD. By simply reverse engineering the disease, optimizing or improving the gut microbiome composition would help to reestablish proper tight junction functioning between intestinal epithelial cells, decreasing intestinal hyperpermeability, and in so doing, 
decrease the hyperactive immune response and inflammation and thus reverse IBD. So the obvious question is what improves the gut microbiome? Based on my experience and independent research, these are the four core principles that I've come up with and followed to improve my gut microbiome composition and get completely better. Drink clean water, consume prebiotics, consume probiotics, exercise. I prioritize drinking high quality and clean water because tap water can be loaded with different chemicals and things like chlorine that can damage the gut microbiome. At one point while trying to heal, I went from being in remission and feeling really good to flaring up really badly after drinking heavily chlorinated water for a few days. It's really hard to find research on how water affects the gut microbiome, specifically in regards to IBD. Now this is not research. This is a concept paper that proposes the same idea that I've been talking about for years, which is that drinking chlorinated water can cause gut microbiome dysbiosis and result in the development or flare up of IBD. Levels of chlorine used to treat metropolitan water are considered safe for the individual based on toxicity studies. However, to our knowledge, there have been no studies examining whether levels of persistent chlorine exposure from tap water are also safe for the ecosystem of microorganisms that colonize the gastrointestinal tract. Given the importance of the microbiome in health, persistent exposure to low levels of chlorine may be a hitherto unrecognized risk factor for gut dysbiosis, which has now been linked to virtually every chronic non-communicable disease of the modern era. More research needs to be done, but this idea is exactly why I drink clean, purified water, and I've seen incredible results from doing so. Consume prebiotic fiber. Prebiotics are defined as non-digestible, fermentable carbohydrates that promote the proliferation of beneficial microorganisms in the gut microbiome. Prebiotic fiber increases the number of probiotic microorganisms in the gut microbiome, decreases the number of pathogenic microorganisms, and it is fermented by probiotics into short-chain fatty acids that are used to reduce intestinal inflammation and repair the gut lining. In fact, research from the American Gut Project shows that people with the healthiest and most diverse gut microbiomes are the ones who consume over 30 different types of plants per week. Now, I realize that fiber is a very controversial topic in the IBD community, and for good reason. There are helpful and unhelpful types of fiber for IBD. Soluble fiber from fruits and tubers is generally soothing because it becomes gelatinous when mixed with water. Think of mashed potatoes or applesauce. Insoluble fiber, found in leafy greens like spinach, cabbage, and kale, does not become gelatinous in water and can be extremely irritating to inflamed intestines. So that's why I focus on eating mostly prebiotic soluble fiber and avoiding as much insoluble fiber, aka roughage, as possible. With this in mind, I need to make a clarification regarding potatoes. Potatoes are one of my favorite sources of good prebiotic soluble fiber. The potato flesh is mostly soluble fiber and the peel is insoluble fiber. In the past boot camp episodes, I always showed the potatoes prepared with the skins because that is the way that I ate them when I was healing. When I first started consistently consuming potatoes, I had just finished 30 days of drinking cabbage juice and had already started following High Carb Health's vegan diet. I was feeling pretty good at this time, so the insoluble fiber from the potato peels did not irritate my colon very much because I was not very inflamed. I did notice that eating potatoes bothered me during the times that I flared up after that point, but I did not have a good understanding of the different types of fiber then, so I didn't think to skin them. I just continued to eat them and push through because I knew the potatoes would stop bothering me once the flare ended as they had in the past. Knowing what I know now, it would have been way better to just skin the potatoes and avoid the peel altogether while I was healing. Now that I am healed, I don't worry about the peels at all. But the people I work with often have a lot of issues with the peels if they're flaring, so I definitely think it's a better idea to skin the potatoes instead of just gritting your teeth like I did. Prebiotic fiber is extremely important for a healthy and diverse gut microbiome, but the focus should be on maximizing soluble, fermentable fiber intake and minimizing insoluble fiber slash roughage intake. My favorite sources of prebiotic soluble and fermentable fiber comes from fruits and tubers. Probiotics are defined as live microorganisms which confer a health benefit to the host, and they are what largely compose the gut microbiome. Probiotic consumption is a way to directly improve the composition of the gut microbiome by simply increasing the number of microorganisms that perform vital, beneficial functions relating to physiology and immunology. 
Probiotic microorganisms regulate the tight junction proteins that regulate intestinal permeability, which has a direct impact on the immune system and thus inflammation. Probiotic therapy has been shown to improve the gut microbiome and increase rates of remission in patients with IBD. A double-blinded study published in the Korean Journal of Gastroenterology tested the effects that probiotic yogurt consumption had on the gut microbiome of IBD patients. 105 patients with IBD and 95 healthy individuals were given 250 grams of probiotic yogurt per day for eight weeks, while another 105 patients with IBD were given 250 grams of placebo per day for eight weeks. The results of the study revealed that IBD patients receiving the probiotic yogurt had a significant increase in lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, well-known probiotic bacteria, and a slight decrease in bacteroides, pathogenic bacteria. It's important to know that even patients with IBD will see an increase in probiotic microorganisms within the gut microbiome if they consume probiotics. It's important because it is known that probiotic microorganisms, specifically lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, are able to decrease pathogenic microorganisms by competitive exclusion. This means that even in patients with IBD, Probiotic therapy improves the gut microbiome composition by directly increasing probiotic microorganisms, which can then begin to competitively exclude and thus decrease pathogenic microorganisms over time. Not only do probiotics improve the gut microbiome, they increase rates of remission. A meta-analysis of 23 randomized controlled trials with a total of 1,763 participants found that patients with active ulcerative colitis treated with probiotics had significantly higher rates of remission than UC patients treated with placebo. Bottom line, probiotic therapy has been found to improve the gut microbiome and increase IBD remission rates. So where do I get my probiotics? I think the best way to get them is from food rather than supplements. I personally prefer raw unpasteurized milk kefir as my number one source of probiotics. However, drinking raw milk significantly increases the risk of foodborne illness, which could potentially result in death. So under no circumstances does the kefir have to be made from raw milk. High quality pasteurized milk can be fermented into kefir. The fermentation process amplifies the amount of probiotic microorganisms and breaks down a significant portion of the lactose, making kefir easier to digest than regular milk. Even things like coconut milk can be fermented into kefir or yogurt with the proper culture starter and be an excellent substitute for dairy-based kefir if you want to avoid dairy entirely. My second favorite source of probiotics comes from lacto-fermented vegetables. I like to use carrots, pickling cucumbers, and celery. Similar to kefir, the fermentation process proliferates the growth of probiotic microorganisms that are great for the gut microbiome and have several other health benefits as well. When I was sick and trying to heal, I noticed that I felt better when I was consistently exercising. When I looked into this, I found that IBD patients can often have a stagnant and clogged lymphatic system, which causes inflammation to get trapped inside the intestines. The lymphatic system is powered by musculoskeletal movement, so exercising gets the lymphatic system flowing and helps dissipate that inflammation by allowing a functional trafficking of immune cells. Exercise doesn't just help reduce inflammation. Growing evidence suggests that it also helps improve the composition of the gut microbiome. This is new information to me and something I'm really excited about. It is not fully understood yet how or why exercise seems to improve the gut microbiome, However, a 2016 study tested 39 healthy individuals and found that independent of diet, the higher an individual's fitness level was, the more diverse that individual's gut microbiome was. Bottom line, moderate exercise encourages better functioning of the immune system, reduces inflammation, and seems to improve slash diversify the gut microbiome. You don't want to overdo it because excessive strenuous exercise such as endurance training for a marathon can have the opposite effect and cause mucosal erosion and colitis symptoms. So overtraining can have deleterious effects, but moderate exercise is an important and often overlooked way to fight IBD. I personally exercise three to four times per week and try to have at least 24 hours in between training sessions to ensure that I have plenty of recovery time and am not overtraining. I prefer lifting and sprints and avoid endurance training. So that's it. Those are my core four principles. Drink clean water, consume prebiotic foods, consume probiotic foods, and exercise three to four times per week. Now that we have the core principles, let's go over what's different from past boot camp episodes. When I first created this series, I designed each of the first seven episodes to be a meal plan for one single day out of the week. 
So episode one would be what to eat on Monday, episode two would be what to eat on Tuesday, and episode three would be what to eat on Wednesday, etc. The idea was to be able to cycle the recipes in those seven episodes for however long it took to be symptom-free for at least one week. At that point, someone could move on to episode eight and nine and eat similarly to those episodes until there was a total resolution of symptoms and then continue eating that way 80% of the time and eating whatever they wanted 20% of the time. In theory, that sounds great, but there are some issues with the recipes in the first seven episodes. I originally thought that eliminating meat in the beginning would expedite the healing process and that it should only be introduced after the majority, if not all, symptoms had subsided. I thought that eating mostly plant-based with the inclusion of raw dairy and fermented vegetables in the beginning was the right way to go based off the research I was reading and my own experience following a plant-based approach. And then I started doing Skype consultations and coaching. What I found was that people I worked with who were severely inflamed did not do well when following the mostly plant-based approach that I outlined in the first seven episodes. And then it dawned on me that it must be the fiber that was exacerbating their symptoms. Yes, even the prebiotic soluble fiber that I tout so strongly. This was obviously confusing to me because I know that prebiotic fiber is very important to optimizing the gut microbiome and reversing IBD. So I went back and thought about my entire 18 month healing process. I remember being able to tolerate the high intake of prebiotic soluble fiber and even the insoluble fiber from potato peels very well right after I finished 30 days of cabbage juicing. I believe the reason I was able to transition to an overall high intake of dietary fiber, mainly soluble fiber, was because the cabbage juice had stopped my flare and decreased my inflammation so much. While I was juicing, the meals I ate were also pretty low in overall fiber. They consisted of baked chicken, steamed white rice, and steamed squash or zucchini. So bottom line, cabbage juice and a low fiber diet reduced my inflammation to the point that higher intakes of soluble fiber and some insoluble fiber were tolerable and didn't exacerbate my symptoms. But then I thought about some of the times that I flared up during the months that followed. After one flare, I tried drinking small amounts of cabbage juice for maybe a week or so before I gave up, and for other flares, I didn't juice cabbage at all. Some of those flares lasted a long time and were not easy to get out of, partially because I was unknowingly irritating my inflamed areas by continuing to consume large amounts of fiber, even though it was mostly soluble. Something I should have done was eaten an overall low fiber diet to stop irritating my inflamed intestines, because both soluble and insoluble fiber cause some irritation when inflamed, even though soluble fiber causes much less irritation than insoluble fiber. Eating a low fiber diet and or following the intense cabbage juice protocol while flaring would have reduced the inflammation faster, which would have then allowed the consumption of the gut microbiome optimizing prebiotic soluble fiber to be more tolerable. So to give credit where credit is due, Mike Merrill, the Heal Your Gut Guy, has been advocating for a low fiber approach to healing IBD ever since he popped up on the scene. Mike is a smart guy and really knows his stuff. I am still very much an advocate of prebiotic soluble fiber for optimizing the gut microbiome and reversing IBD because that's what the research says and that's what my personal experience has reflected. However, after learning from Mike and from the people I've coached, it's very clear that when high levels of inflammation and disease activity are present, a high intake of any type of fiber can exacerbate symptoms and do more harm than good. Initially, the cabbage juice and low fiber diet allowed me to transition to a higher fiber diet with little issue, and then after that I was committed to sticking with a whole food, plant-based diet for at least a year. The times that I flared up during that year, I just pushed through for the most part and dealt with the exacerbation of symptoms that comes with eating a higher intake of fiber while flaring, even though it was mainly prebiotic soluble fiber. Eventually, I weathered the storm, my symptoms began to subside, the prebiotic soluble fiber was able to begin helping the gut microbiome optimization process, and then eventually, at the end of 13 months and a few flares, I adopted the rest of my gut microbiome optimization principles previously discussed, began consuming animal products again, and eventually was able to completely heal and get to where I am today. So what's the take home message here? Prebiotic soluble fiber is still important. It's still important for gut microbiome optimization. It's still a core principle. It's still a big part of long-term success. This is one of the main things that High Carb Health harps on, and they're right. How can Heal Your Gut Guy and High Carb Health both be right? Well, when someone is really inflamed, a low fiber diet can be helpful because it doesn't exacerbate the symptoms. But once prebiotic fermentable fiber can be tolerated, it should be consumed because it does build a robust and diverse gut microbiome. 
So there is a time in which both a low fiber diet and a higher fiber diet can be helpful. When I was sick, I was like a horse with blinders on. I didn't care if eating fiber hurt. I didn't care if it exacerbated my symptoms short term. I honestly really didn't understand the different types of fiber and how they affected me at the time. I was determined to just keep following the whole food plant-based diet for the arbitrary amount of time I decided on, which was 13 months. Retrospectively, I could have spared myself a lot of pain and suffering during my flares if I had adhered to a low fiber diet until I was no longer flaring and then transitioned to consuming more prebiotic soluble fiber. At that time, I thought that the pain and length of those flares were a normal and necessary part of me healing. But now, I know that the pain and length of those flares could have been mitigated, at least somewhat, with a low fiber diet. And so, realizing this after coaching people and taking a page out of Mike's book, the big change to my bootcamp series regarding fiber is this. If you're really inflamed, both types of fiber can exacerbate the inflammation and worsen symptoms. In this case, consuming an overall low fiber diet and maybe adding in the cabbage juice protocol until the inflammation has significantly decreased will then allow the consumption of the prebiotic soluble fiber to be more tolerable. Here is a flowchart to illustrate the changes. If you're really inflamed, low fiber diet and maybe cabbage juice, decrease the inflammation, begin updated boot camp protocol. Not flaring or mild symptoms, begin updated boot camp protocol. Besides the change in fiber, I've also rethought my stance on the inclusion of meat early on in the healing phase. Once again, I originally thought meat should be eliminated in the beginning while following the first seven episodes and only be introduced once the majority of symptoms had stopped for at least one week. I thought this because meat, for the most part, doesn't have any specific gut microbiome optimizing properties the way that prebiotic foods and probiotic foods do. Also, carbohydrates are easier and faster to digest than protein is. Carbs break down much faster than protein does in the digestive system. So, meat doesn't necessarily help the gut microbiome, and it is tougher to digest than carbohydrates. So that is why I thought that meat should just be avoided until most IBD symptoms had stopped. But now, after a few months of feedback from doing online coaching, reflecting on my own experience, paying more attention to people like Jordan Rubin, picking up tips from Mike Merrill, the Heal Your Gut Guy, and some other people who have incredible healing stories, my position has changed to this. Meat can be included at the beginning of the healing process and be consumed throughout the entire healing process. What is the reasoning behind this? Just because meat doesn't optimize the gut microbiome itself doesn't mean that it will necessarily inhibit gut microbiome optimization or healing. As long as prebiotic and probiotic foods are being consumed along with meat, the gut microbiome should improve and healing should take place. Jordan Rubin is an excellent example of this. Jordan Rubin, author of The Maker's Diet and Patient Heal Thyself, is one of the first pioneers to beat IBD. He had what is called Crohn's colitis, which nearly killed him. He is a huge inspiration to me, and he ate meat throughout his entire healing process while consuming prebiotic and probiotic foods. Mike Merrill, the healer gut guy, is obviously another name that ate meat while he was healing from Crohn's disease, though he's got his own protocol and didn't focus on prebiotics the way that I did. Nikki from ulcerativecolitiscure.com also ate meat throughout her healing process. She has a very detailed protocol that includes several supplements and food combining tips. And then also, there's me. I ate meat, mostly chicken, every day during the 30 days that I drank cabbage juice. During that time, I was eating a relatively low fiber diet, I wasn't very focused on prebiotics or probiotics, and I still was able to stop a bad flare and decrease my overall symptoms by what I estimate to be about 70%. I then eliminated meat and went vegan for 13 months and had several ups and downs before switching back to meat when I began following a targeted gut microbiome optimizing protocol. I healed a few months after making that change. So the point is, several big names ate meat throughout their entire healing process, and during the times that I ate meat, it did not inhibit my healing. I was eating meat the last few months of my healing process and have continued to do so ever since. So, I do think that meat can be included from the beginning of the healing process, but I would be careful not to overdo it. There is some research that indicates high meat consumption actually causes gut microbiome dysbiosis, which is what we want to avoid because it is the opposite of gut microbiome optimization. Moderate amounts of meat can be included at the beginning, but it does not have to be. However, one of the practical benefits of including meat from the get-go is that it makes it easier to consume a larger amount of calories each day to prevent weight loss. Whether someone is trying to follow a low-fiber diet at first or is following the higher-fiber diet shown in the first seven episodes, 
it can be incredibly difficult to eat an adequate amount of calories without including meat. So, eating meat will help fix the calorie problem. It will also make intermittent fasting easier, which is something else I like to practice because it reduces the amount of times the gastrocolic reflex is triggered, which helps reduce bowel movement frequency. I don't want to take the time to explain why that's important in this video, but I have a whole video that explains it in detail if you want to learn more about that. It's hard to do intermittent fasting and meet your caloric needs in two meals when only eating fruits, tubers, and raw dairy, which is why the first seven episodes of the boot camp series have three meals per episode slash day. As for meat being harder to break down and digest than carbohydrates, that's just part of the biochemical process of digesting meat. I don't think that's a big deal anymore, and I don't think it hinders the healing process. So basically, as long as the four gut microbiome optimizing principles are being followed, moderate consumption of meat can be included from the beginning of the healing process. This makes eating enough calories easier and intermittent fasting easier, not to mention the increased bioavailability of certain micronutrients and the mental freedom of being able to eat meat. Before I start the recipes and the cooking, I want to give a quick summary of the changes I made to my boot camp philosophy. Initially, when I created the series, I intended for episodes 1 through 7 to be mostly plant-based with the exception of raw dairy and to only include meat once an individual had been asymptomatic for at least one week. At that time, the individual could add in meat and begin following the blueprint that is shown in boot camp episodes 8 and 9. The biggest difference between episodes 1 through 7 and 8 through 9 is that 1 through 7 does not include meat and 8 through 9 does include meat. I no longer think it is necessary to eliminate meat in the beginning. As long as an individual is able to tolerate higher amounts of prebiotic soluble fiber, I think it is absolutely okay to start out following the dietary blueprint that is shown in episodes 8 and 9. However, some people may be too severely inflamed to start off consuming such high amounts of prebiotic soluble fiber. So, in this episode, I'm going to show two phases. In the first phase, I will show how to eat a relatively low fiber diet that still adheres to my gut microbiome optimizing principles and is meant to ease someone into the second phase, which has a much higher prebiotic fiber content. But this is very important. Let me be clear on what I mean by a low fiber diet. Low fiber to me does not mean eliminate all fiber. When I talk about adhering to a low fiber diet, I mean a lower fiber diet in comparison to the previous boot camp episodes. My idea of a low fiber diet still includes a good bit of prebiotic fiber. For example, I'd start with just eliminating fruits and smoothies and instead focus on consuming high quality meats and foods like skinned potatoes, white rice, steamed squash, steamed zucchini, and steamed carrots. This closely resembles the diet I followed during the 30 days of drinking cabbage juice. Choosing from these foods makes it easy to eat an adequate amount of calories per day in two meals while also continuing to provide prebiotics but also keeping the overall fiber consumption much lower than what is shown in the previous boot camp episodes. I realize that some people may not agree with me, and I completely understand. Some people may be so inflamed that they can't even tolerate my version of a low fiber diet. If that is the case, use good judgment and lower or increase the consumption of fiber based on what you are able to tolerate comfortably. If you want to lower the overall amount of fiber far more than what I consider to be a low fiber diet, feel free to do so. My version of a low fiber diet is meant to be reflective of my experience and what worked for me. The second phase reflects my classic boot camp recipes and will closely follow the blueprint that is shown in episodes 8 and 9. These two phases represent the overall updated boot camp blueprint. So one last time, the overall boot camp changes are the addition of a low fiber phase for people who are in severe flares and then adding meat to the last recipes in episodes 1 through 7 so that the entire boot camp as a whole resembles the blueprint in episodes 8, 9, and now 10. Phase 1. These two recipes represent a full day of meals for someone who wants to follow a relatively low fiber diet to let their symptoms and inflammation calm down before they begin following the higher prebiotic fiber boot camp recipes. The style of eating shown in this phase can be followed, however long is necessary, for the individual to be able to tolerate a higher intake of prebiotic soluble fiber. Once a higher intake of prebiotic soluble fiber is tolerable, then the individual can move on to the next phase of eating, which will represent the updated boot camp blueprint. Just FYI, the meats that I typically choose from are high quality chicken, fish, beef, and lamb. That's not an exclusive list, just what I typically eat. The first recipe is going to be the classic meal that I ate during the 30 days that I drank cabbage juice. 
baked chicken with steamed white rice and steamed squash. To make sure the meal is complete, I'm going to add 12 to 24 ounces of kefir for a hefty dose of probiotic microorganisms. White rice has a minimal amount of fiber, and if someone really wants to drop the fiber content of the meal even more, they can peel the squash too. I have not included white rice in my boot camp series before because I had not made up my mind about it, but I have now. I think white rice is absolutely okay because the bran has been removed, making it a very low fiber plant food. I had good experiences with white rice during the few times that I did eat it while healing, but brown rice should be avoided like the plague. Brown rice, especially when still healing, can tear you up and really cause some issues. Overall, this is an awesome meal with a relatively low overall fiber content that still contains some prebiotic soluble fiber and a powerful dose of probiotics. The second recipe is a very similar version of the first one and consists of baked fish, steamed skinned potatoes to remove the insoluble fibrous peel, and steamed zucchini. The zucchini can be peeled as well if you really want to avoid as much insoluble fiber as possible. This meal will again be completed with 12 to 24 ounces of raw kefir to pack a probiotic punch. phase two. Do not move on to phase two if you're still flaring. If you move on to phase two while flaring, that defeats the purpose of phase one. Phase one is meant to limit further irritation of inflamed intestines as much as possible while slowly moving towards optimizing the gut microbiome. Phase two is meant to more aggressively optimize and diversify the gut microbiome by introducing new types of prebiotic fermentable fiber as well as fermented vegetables for additional probiotics. The first recipe is one I've shown before. It's my favorite smoothie. Chock full of soluble prebiotic fermentable fiber and a ton of probiotic microorganisms. 
The smoothie ingredients are four bananas, one avocado, two cups of blueberries, one to two tablespoons of cacao powder, and 12 ounces or more of raw milk kefir. This is a great gut microbiome optimizing meal. The second recipe is a filling meal that is very similar to a phase one meal. Baked lamb, turmeric white rice, steamed zucchini, half an avocado, a half cup of fermented vegetables, and 12 to 24 ounces of kefir. I really like turmeric. It's an awesome anti-inflammatory spice and it tastes really good. This meal doesn't have a super high prebiotic content, but that's okay because the smoothie that would also be consumed in the same day has a ton of prebiotics. If someone wanted to increase the prebiotic content, they could replace the turmeric white rice with steamed skinned potatoes or have both the rice and potatoes. If someone finds that the insoluble fibrous peel of the zucchini bothers them, then I would just go ahead and peel the zucchini. Carrots are one of my favorite foods to ferment because they remain pretty firm after being fermented, so they're still crunchy instead of soggy, and they've also got some good prebiotic qualities as well. Again, the kefir provides a strong dose of probiotic microorganisms that are important for optimizing the gut microbiome. Quick answers to FAQs. Why hasn't cabbage juice been a central part of my bootcamp series? Cabbage juice was not integral to my long-term success the way that optimizing the gut microbiome was. Cabbage juice did an awesome job of getting me out of a bad flare, but it does not fix the root cause of IBD. Also, I think it tastes really bad. I think it could be a very helpful addition to my bootcamp protocol, but not a necessary one. 
What's my opinion on bone broth? I like it. What about taking probiotic supplements? I think the focus should mainly be on consuming fermented foods rather than relying on a supplement. But I think adding a supplement to the overall regimen is a great idea. There are three supplements I like. Fluorocor GI by AST Enzymes. Gutley's Organic Liquid Probiotic. I actually have an affiliate with Gutley. They're an awesome family-owned company that makes a great product. Use the discount code Kenny to get 10% off. And Seed is the last one I really like. I'm not as consistent as I should be with my supplements, but I do use all three. Do I do online coaching? Yes. Send me an email if you want to set that up. Is raw dairy absolutely necessary? No, there are substitutes for it. However, I would not drink pasteurized milk unless it's been fermented into kefir or yogurt. So that is the final installment of my bootcamp series. It's not perfect by any means, and it doesn't include absolutely everything I've learned or the things I'm continuing to learn. I've tried to be as thorough as possible, but I'm sure there will inevitably be questions, and I welcome them. Please ask questions. Please point out things I may have overlooked. I want to hear from you and communicate with you. If you decide you want more help than what is provided in this series or the rest of my channel, please send me an email and we can discuss setting up a Skype consultation. I want you to get better. I don't care if it's my way or someone else's way. I want you to get better because I know what it feels like to be sick. Getting healed is really hard but staying healed is easy. I can't and won't promise that you will get better, but I absolutely believe it's possible and that the majority of people can heal the same way I did by optimizing the gut microbiome.